The greed of humanity is nothing new, and like any of the other deadly sins, it can have devastating consequences when acted upon. In March 2008, in a small campus town in North Carolina, this sin would be acted on in a very harrowing manner, thus creating a tragedy which left an emotional scar on thousands of people. But what precisely happened to Eve Carson? How did she end up falling victim? And what evidence was left behind to catch her killers? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening folks, and welcome or welcome back to Coffee House Crime. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the heartbreaking case of Eve Carson. Now this story really is a case of wrong place, wrong time, and with the victim so popular, the killers accidentally left a massive hole in the community. By the way, just like a barista loves a tip, I really do appreciate people subscribing to my channel, so if you would like to hear true crime weekly, then please consider doing so. Just a spoiler alert, but this man is struggling with COVID for a third time now, so apologies for the performance today. Yep, this video is sponsored by Lemsip. Not really. Now with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Eve Carson. Today we're returning to the US, and to one of its eastern coastline states. It's home to the Wright Brothers, Krispy Kreme, and the Great Smoky Mountains. And so with that said, welcome to Carolina, folks. To keep things relatively short and sweet, the Tar Heel State has many good things going for itself. Despite it currently ranking 14th in the list of most poverty-ridden states, North Carolina's booming business industry is pulling it in a more positive financial direction. STEM industries are on the rise, and thanks to its pleasant and warm climate, many are making the move over here. But unfortunately, this is only in its cities and built-up areas. The wealth divide between urban and country has escalated in recent years, and this state is a primary example of the ever-growing great urbanization effect. Drive into the state's capital, Raleigh, and you'll see plenty of development going on here. Its core industries include financial services, medical and pharmaceuticals, and in recent years it has become a major player in biotech and similar high-tech research. This is due to its continuous investment in medical research and educational facilities, with Wake Med, UNC Rex Healthcare, and the University of North Carolina all being some of the city's top employers. Drive out to the west of Raleigh's borders and south of its neighbour Durham and you'll come across a town named Chapel Hill. With a population of 62,000 residents, it's primarily serves as home to a campus of the University of North Carolina. Now, this town is pertinent to our case, and why, you may ask? Well, that's because it's home to the main person in our story. As you would expect from most university towns, living in Chapel Hill offers residents an urban-suburban atmosphere. Most of the people here tend to rent their homes, and with so many restaurants, coffee shops, and parks, it is no wonder why this place has such a small-town vibe. Chapel Hill has several great places to grab a coffee, or so I've been told, and with so many parks and creeks around, it offers fantastic walking trails in the springtime. To be honest with you, I can see the potential in being a student here. The rent is cheap, the schools are well known, and there's plenty of things to do here. Satisfaction rates for those who actually attend university are impressively high here too. And as for the crime rate, it's below national average. Those who aren't employed by the university are used to the students and their parties, and otherwise they enjoy a very peaceful and safe community. Which is probably why, on March the 5th, 2008, everyone was shocked to hear the news. It was around 5am that morning that a resident in the area of Hillcrest Circle, which is located northeast of Chapel Hill and UNC, was awoken to a terrifying situation. After hearing a single gunshot, a woman's scream rang out from beyond the tree line, and following this already chilling sound were three more gunshots in rapid succession. Our scanning 911, this is Rob. Hi, um, I think I just heard gunshots outside. Okay. How many shots did you hear? Four. You heard four? I think so, yeah. Okay. Did you see anyone by chance? No, no. I mean, I, you know, I was laying awake in bed. And I yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you want, can you want to speak to an officer about this? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> Gunshots. Three. How long ago did this happen? Three, five seconds. 
because you heard a female scream. Has anything like this ever happened before? Uh, I've heard gunshots before. I don't think I've heard screaming. Understandably too scared to investigate, the resident dialed 911 immediately, and officers responding to the call were met with a stomach-churning scene. A body was found lying near the intersection of Hillcrest Road and Hillcrest Circle. The victim was a young woman likely in her 20s. No identifying information was found at the scene, however, meaning it was possible that the murder had been motivated by robbery. Whoever had shot this woman clearly had no regard for human life. She had been shot several times with a handgun. At a height of 5 foot 5 and 138 pounds, or 1 meter 66 and 62 kilograms, the young woman was fairly petite in size. And based on her age, it was likely that she was a student studying at the local campus. And sadly, these assumptions would turn out to be factual. Once the news broke out across Chapel Hill, word spread around the town like wildfire. And after realizing that their housemate hadn't returned home overnight, several students contacted the police for potential reassurance. Now, unfortunately, that reassurance never arrived, and after a visual examination of the body, they were able to confirm that it belonged to their housemate, and her name was Eve Carson. A student at the University of North Carolina, Eve Carson was well-loved, well-known, and very successful to say the least. She served as student body president, and to add to this, was a recipient of the Moorhead Kane Scholarship. Beginning with her backstory, Eve was born on November 19th, 1985, in Athens, Georgia. Her mother, Teresa, and father, Bob Carson, were loving parents that provided a solid start to her childhood. And alongside her brother, Andrew, the four remained in Athens throughout her junior years. Now, this is no overstatement, but Eve was one of the most exemplary students any school or parent could ask for. And not only was she a straight-A student, but she was very popular with her peers too. While attending Clark Central High School, Eve was elected to become student body president after receiving 55% of all total votes. Not only that, but she was also her year's valedictorian, a title served to the highest performing student of the year. Intelligence aside, she was well loved by her friends and trusted by her peers and teachers, and winning the student president elections is probably enough to prove her popularity and likability. Now they say that pictures paint a thousand words, so instead of listening to me rambling, here's an archived video of Eve welcoming students students back to the UNC. Hey y'all, my name is Eve Carson and I'm your student body president. It's great to be in Chapel Hill. If you're a returning student, can't wait to see you again. If you're a new student, welcome to the Carolina family. So this is the student government office, room 2501 in the new student union and I'll, as your representation, this office is here for you. Um, we've got computers you can use, there's a printing station, there's another printer on the other side. And here, we've got a lot of people moving in. Uh, this is Lauren, she's a senior class marshal. There are three branches of student government, executive, legislative, and judicial. And so, executive branch, or E-branch, and student congress are located in this office. And the judicial branch, which is the honor court, is located down in SASB. I really want to encourage all of you guys to take advantage of the incredible opportunities that our campus offers. You know, from Campus Y to Millennium Village Project to Student Television to the Daily Tar Heel to Student Government, there are so many incredible ways that you can get involved. And um, I've really found that my experience has been enriched by the ways that we give back to our communities and to our campus. Also, I personally invite you to come hang out with me. Um, I spend a lot of time in this office and I love saying hi and meeting new people. So if I can help you or if I can help you figure out how you want to get involved on campus, Please come by and, and let's talk. But Eve Carson's service extended well beyond her curricular studies. As part of the Moorhead Summer Enrichment Program, she volunteered to work during her summer holidays in Ecuador, Egypt, and Ghana. While there, she worked as a medical assistant in the countryside, volunteered to work on a coffee farm, and taught some locals basic computer skills. As you can likely imagine, Eve was more than capable of getting into the likes of Princeton and Yale. In fact, she was even offered scholarships for both of them, which honestly is an insanely talented achievement. However, in true Eve fashion, she made the decision to attend a public school instead. This decision led her to North Carolina in the autumn of 2004. 
and under the prestigious Moorhead Scholarship, she attended UNC to study pre-medicine, majoring in both political science and biology. During college, Eve led numerous organizations and service projects, leading her to eventually being selected to be a North Carolina Fellow and take part in a four-year leadership program. In addition to all of this, she tutored students at Frank Porter Graham Elementary School and Githens Middle School. She also worked with Girls on the Run, which is a program that helps build confidence and empowerment in young women. In short, Eve really was extraordinary. She was a natural-born leader, compassionate, and so enthusiastic and interested in everyone around her. And now, with her death, she left a grievous hole in the hearts of countless people. The community had no idea what to make of this situation, because, popularity aside, a student had suddenly died in a remote woodland just off campus. And although most murder cases tend to be a one-off scenario, the lack of evidence left no hint if this would happen again. Now, Eve's death appeared to be random. She was last seen by her housemates around 1.30 that morning, where she stayed home to study as they all went out for drinks. But what happened between that time and 5am, at this stage was anyone's guess. The following morning, and after an anonymous tip, the police found her car not too far away from the crime scene. And of course, they went to go take a look. Now to Chapel Hill, where a police tip line has been ringing all day. Investigators are working every lead in the search for Eve Carson's killer. They're going through every inch of her SUV. It's believed the killer shot her in a neighborhood near campus, then took off in her truck. Our team coverage begins with Dan Bowens outside police headquarters. Dan. Pam, Chapel Hill police do not have any suspects in this case, and they are calling the murder of Eve Carson a random act of violence. They've spent much of the last 48 hours trying to obtain her phone records, her bank records, and looking through her SUV for any sign of evidence that could help them solve this case. Evidence inside Eve Carson's SUV could provide important information about her murder. Chapel Hill Police spent much of Friday reviewing the contents inside. WRAL has learned detectives are investigating two crimes in the UNC student body president's death, the theft of Carson's SUV and the murder. Police believe the killer was in Carson's Toyota at some point. Carson lived just a block off the main business district of Franklin Street on Friendly Lane. Police found her body Wednesday morning a little more than a mile from her home in a residential part of town at Hillcrest Road. Her SUV was found at the intersection of North Street and Hillsborough. Police believe Carson was shot with a handgun several times at around 5.30 Wednesday morning, including one shot to her right temple. She was last seen alive by her roommates at around 1.30 that morning. Detectives are still trying to piece together what happened in between. And Chapel Hill Police also announced today that there is a $25,000 reward for anyone who could help them solve this crime. Dan Bowen's live in Chapel Hill, thank you. The blue 2005 Toyota Highlander, still sporting Georgia plates, was found near the intersection of North and Hillsborough Street, which from that location was a 30 minute walk from where her body was found. The car wasn't too far from her home either, which of course was where she'd disappeared from. 202 Friendly Lane was only a stone's throw away from the vehicle, so in that regard, officers couldn't be sure whether she'd left it there by herself before the incident, or closer to the time of the gunshots being heard. Forensic analysts were eventually able to confirm that the last activity on Eve's computer was at 3.37 a.m., more than two hours after her roommates left the property. This was good information to have, as it could be used by the authorities to refine the time frame in which she may have been kidnapped. And at long last, a clue to her killer, or killers, and a potential motive finally came in. After gaining access to her financial accounts, investigators were able to deduce that at 3.55 a.m. on the night she disappeared, which was only 21 minutes since her computer's last activity, several attempts were made to withdraw cash from her bank account. The attempts were made at an ATM at the University Mall in Chapel Hill, which was north of the university and where Eve's body was discovered. The daily maximum of $700 was pulled out of the account, with the next five attempts remaining unsuccessful. And this is where investigators got their first big breakthrough. With this particular ATM being a drive through machine, the building was equipped with surveillance cameras. And during the time her card was being used to withdraw cash, the camera had taken several several images of the card's user. Although the footage is grainy, a young man wearing a hoodie and a black cap can be seen. And in one of these still images, it appears that a second person can be seen in one of the car's rear passenger seats. Now, Eve was still alive at the time these photos were being taken, so could it possibly have been her? 
Or was there another person accompanying the hooded figure? Analysts were eventually able to enhance this photo to a higher resolution and with colour. However, the figure or figures in the back of the car were still not discernible. At 4.44am on the same morning, another attempt was made to withdraw funds from her bank account. However, no surveillance footage captured the person responsible for the withdrawal. And sadly, just 24 minutes later, Eve Carson was shot five times. But these wouldn't be the only attempts made over the following days. Just seven hours later, at 12.39pm, her card was used twice more at a mini-mart along Moorhead Avenue in Durham. Then again the next day, at 12.16am, and yet again at a fifth location the day after. Whoever was trying to steal money out of her account was becoming very brazen, and quite frankly, sloppy in their work. And this final risk held dire consequences for them, because lo and behold, this fifth and final place had a camera. At 12.54am on the morning of March 7th, a surveillance camera captured this person walking into the Carolina Food Mart on Alston Avenue. They walked up to the store's ATM machine, used Eve's card, and was ultimately declined. But what was interesting to officers is that while this was a male figure, it clearly was not the same guy seen in the previous surveillance footage, meaning they either had two suspects in this case, or one red herring. While officers got to work on identifying and locating their suspects, the towns of Chapel Hill and Athens united in grief for Eve Carson, and on March 9th, 2008, she was laid to rest. Hundreds attended her funeral, and back in Carolina, thousands of people gave her a minute of silence out of respect. Honestly, this young woman was loved beyond all measure. Despite several surveillance images and their best efforts, progress on this case was initially slow. However, on March the 12th, seven days after her death, the police finally had a lead. Following an anonymous tip and an uncanny resemblance to the surveillance photo, police focused their sights on a man named Demario James Atwater. Demario was problematic to say the least. Aged 21 at the time, he already had two prior felony convictions, had committed several further crimes while on parole, and was even set to be in court two days before Eve's murder. Demario's criminal history, dating back to 2004, includes convictions of assault, robbery, trespassing, and possession of marijuana with intent to sell. He was caught breaking into a home in 2005, and again in 2006 while on probation. To add to this, he had also been caught carrying a gun while on probation, but due to a courtroom mix up, his hearing was rescheduled past the date of Eve's death. His criminal profile seemed to fit the murder case too. It was hard to argue that DeMario was not the man in the surveillance footage captured at the Carolina Food Mart on Alston Avenue, and to add to this, DeMario didn't live far from the crime scene either, residing on Rosedale Avenue in Durham, which was just northeast of Chapel Hill. And after learning that he was friends with another man named Lawrence Alvin Lovett, detectives noticed that he looked extraordinarily like the other suspect from the bank surveillance footage. Both Lawrence and DeMario were high school dropouts from Durham and since they both attended the same school, their connection to one another made sense. And so, on the morning of March 12, 2008, police officers decided to pay DeMario a little visit. We were in court, in Hillsborough, when DeMario Atwater faced a judge charged with the murder of the UNC student body president. He's not the only suspect either. Chapel Hill and Durham police are looking for Lawrence Lovett. He is considered armed and dangerous. Warrants also charge him with Carson's murder. This as of late this afternoon, a standoff unfolded at the home owned by someone with the same last name. Special enforcement teams rolled in and blasted down doors and windows. No word yet whether Lovett was inside. We began our team coverage right now live in Chapel Hill where Amanda Lamb has spent the day following the latest developments. Amanda. Pam, as you said, big developments in this case today. Tips from those surveillance video pictures allowed police to arrest one suspect and identify another. Now police have a name to put with this face of a suspect in this convenience store surveillance video. They say this man who tried to use Eve Carson's ATM card is 21-year-old Demario Atwater. A tip from that picture led them to arrest Atwater in Durham on first-degree murder charges. At approximately 5 a.m., Demario James Atwater, 21 years old, was taken into police custody after he was observed exiting the residence. Curran also said they are still looking for another suspect. This man, the driver in what was believed to be Carson's SUV at a bank ATM machine in this surveillance picture. 17-year-old Lawrence Lovett. Lawrence Alvin Lovett Jr. should be considered armed and dangerous. 
we would uh, encourage citizens not to approach him if they see him. Just one week after Carson was found shot to death in a neighborhood near UNC's campus, Chapel Hill Mayor Kevin Foy thanked the police for their hard work, but reminded everyone that a cloud of grief still lingers here. As encouraging as the developments today are, we are still a community in grief. We have come together during this difficult time to comfort each other and to help heal our community. But we also still must offer comfort to a family in mourning. Now, Lawrence was eventually arrested and charged with murder alongside his partner in crime. Aged 17, he was still legally just a child, but he too had previous convictions. Already on probation for larceny and breaking and entering charges, Lawrence also lived in the Durham area. And let's be real here, with the surveillance images at hand, both he and DeMario were now in a very challenging position. By the end of March 2008, an Orange County jury indicted both DeMario and Lawrence on first-degree murder charges. By July, those charges had extended to first-degree kidnapping, first-degree robbery with a dangerous weapon, felonious larceny, possession of a firearm by a felon, and felonious possession of stolen goods. And despite this already formidable list of crimes, in addition to the new charges, Lawrence was also charged with murder of Abhijit Mahato, who was a 29-year-old engineering student at Duke University. Now, I won't go into much detail about Abhijit's case, because in the end, Lawrence would ultimately be found not guilty of his death. But Abhijit left India in the year 2006 to attend Duke University. But on the night of January 18th, 2008, which was only a few weeks before Eve's death, he found his untimely demise. After his house was broken into, Abhijit was driven to an ATM machine, forced to drain his savings account, and then was driven back home. And then tragically, after this, the burglar then shot him in the face through a pillow. Considering some loose evidence and a similar modus operandi, Lawrence was tried for Abhijit's murder. But very little physical evidence was able to tie the two together, and eventually he was acquitted. And to this day, Abhijit Mahato's murder is still unsolved. Moving back to Eve Carson's case, prosecutors were gearing up to try both Damaro and Lawrence for her murder, and of course they would be tried separately. As an adult, Damaro was facing the death penalty. However, for Lawrence, because he was 17 at the time, would not face such a sentence. But with multiple crime scenes and a case so complex, it would take both prosecutors and the defense many years to gather their evidence for the trial. And what they would eventually unearth over the course of two years was a very cruel, callous and cold story which was built around greed and, tragically, random selection. It all started in the early morning hours of March 5th, 2008. Eva had made the decision to stay home and revise, leaving her alone at home while her housemates went out for a few drinks at around 1.30am. At around 3.30 that morning, and around the corner on East Rosemary Street, another student was on the phone in her car. That is when she noticed two men, which were Lawrence and DeMario, staring at her. Concerned for her safety, she drove away, and peering through her rearview mirror as she left, she noticed them walking towards friendly lane, which of course was Eve's street. Cell phone data confirms that Lawrence's phone made several connections to a cell tower nearby. It turns out that the two of them were looking out for easy targets. Out on bond, they were both very low on cash, and figured that they'd steal the money they need rather than earn it in an honest manner. Both Lawrence and Damaro had no idea who Eve was, and neither did she know them. They had never met her before in their lives, and had no former tip-off or clue of her existence. But when they saw her studying alone at home, they decided that she was vulnerable to their wicked plan, and that she was going to be their victim. Within minutes, they had broken into her home, threatened her at gunpoint, and hauled her outside to her car. And we know from her computer's activity that this happened at around 3.37am. Lawrence and DeMario then kidnapped her, putting her in the back seat of her SUV as they went to withdraw money from multiple ATMs. This included the one on Willow Drive, where these surveillance images were captured. At 4.44am, a second ATM was tried at Northgate Mall, but since they'd already withdrawn her daily limit, no more could be taken. After several attempts, they then ordered her to walk with them through a wooded neighbourhood, and that is when they reached the intersection between between Hillcrest Circle and Hillcrest Road. When Eve realised that they were going to kill her, she responded by asking them to pray with her, but instead, the two men opened fire. She took four shots from two handguns, before finally being shot with a sawn-off shotgun. Lawrence and DeMario then fled the scene, leaving her body to be found by officers later that morning. They had brutally claimed the life of a bright, beautiful young woman, all in the name of epoxy several hundred dollars each.
Warrants later confirmed that $1,400 had been taken from her account, which was the maximum that could be withdrawn in a 48-hour time frame. Once authorities captured DeMario, he did confess that he was the one in the surveillance footage, and would later tell officers that Lawrence was his accomplice. Beginning with DeMario, he avoided a full trial by pleading guilty to all federal charges put against him, and even apologised to Eve's parents in court. As a result, on September 23, 2010, he was given a life sentence with an additional 30 years behind bars and since he pleaded guilty himself, he would avoid the death penalty. Lawrence took a different approach. He pleaded not guilty to state charges of first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, first-degree armed robbery, felonious larceny, and felonious possession of stolen goods. For this decision, he was asked to face the judge and jury in a trial, which began in December 2011. But after this two-week trial, Lawrence was found guilty on all charges, and was therefore sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. There were complications to this case, however. On February the 5th, 2011, in 2013, the North Carolina Court of Appeals vacated Lawrence's life sentence and ordered a new sentencing hearing. They cited that a mandatory sentence of life in prison without parole for defendants under 18 at the time of a crime is cruel and unusual punishment. And so, on June 3rd, 2011, a second trial was held. During this time, Lawrence said, You know, people make mistakes. Nobody is perfect. I'm not the monster that y'all made me out to be. I know this has been a traumatic ordeal for everybody involved. For that, I send my condolences to everybody who's been affected by it. If it means anything to anybody, it means something to me. After very careful deliberation and taking Lawrence's, um, powerful statement to heart, the judge once again found him guilty on all charges and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In my opinion, the only right outcome, given the nature of his foul actions. Since being thrown behind bars, Lawrence has made seven further infractions. Safe to say he's not done himself any favours. Not that it matters anyway, he will never be a free man again. Now, usually I'd argue that someone so young has the chance to learn from their mistakes. Fully grown adults are rarely the same as when they were 17. But Lawrence seems to be one of those rare exceptions. He seems rotten right through to the core, with no chance of rehabilitation. With the murder of Abhijit aside, there does seem to be several other strange side notes to this case. Beginning with DeMario, but several months after his arrest, his stepbrother Shelton was shot dead. While attending a house party in the late hours of 8th of November 2008, he and another friend were shot in the back while leaving the front door. Shelton was a good kid, and he was not following the same troubled path his older brother had taken, and understandably, the news devastated their mother. In the space of one year, she had lost two of her sons. Moving back to Eve, her death highlighted an ugly flaw in the judicial system. During the time of her murder, both of her killers were on probation, and neither was being adequately monitored during this time frame. And furthermore, probation officers failed to revoke Demario's probation after learning he had violated their agreed rules. The probation officers did finally catch up with Demario in February 2008. An arrest warrant was served in his name, where he was subsequently jailed. But after posting a $10,000 bond, Demario was freed once again pending a court hearing on March the 3rd. As said before, this court hearing was postponed by four weeks following a courtroom mix-up, but that new date would never arrive, as two days later, Eve Carson was murdered. It is alleged that DeMario was hell-bent on recovering the $10,000 he had lost to his bond, and this was the main reason and motivation to robbing Eve. Now, it takes a special kind of stupid to try and fix a crime with another crime, we really are talking about morons here. But I guess that's why so many of these stories exist, because at the end of the day, people are just people. And the worst of us are vicious idiots. Unfortunately, this case could have been avoided had it not been for the sloppy work of probation officers. And the consequence to all of this was the life of Eve Carson. Eve was, and still is, I should say, an extraordinary woman. Those who knew her described her as someone who glowed with joy, was extremely compassionate, and genuinely cared for others. She was enthusiastic and hardworking, and expressed her selflessness through countless hours of charity work. Not just at home, but abroad during her summer holidays too. Eve actively made connections with everyone around her, and through the dozens of public videos of her online, it is abundantly clear that she put others before herself. And even in her final minutes, she made the best out of her situation by asking Lawrence and DeMario to pray with her. To honour her life, 
life, the University of North Carolina established the Eve Carson Scholarship, which is student-run and awarded annually to two juniors at the University of North Carolina. It's intended to allow students to give more back to UNC by removing some of the financial burden inflicted through tuition fees. I am sure this is intentional, as the scholarship was Eve's idea in the first place. In the months leading up to her death, and while student president, she'd been fighting for such an idea. Eve posthumously received the Chancellor's Award for the most outstanding woman in her senior class, and was also granted the Distinguished Young Alumnus Award. Her funeral brought hundreds together, and her service in Chapel Hill was reportedly attended by up to 10,000 people. And still, to this day, many remember her face and name around campus. It's hard to tell where Eve would be now if her life hadn't been cruelly cut so short. She was interested in science policy, and planned to pursue further higher education after graduating from UNC. She also accepted a job at McKinsey and Company as a management consultant. As you can see, the young woman was clearly destined for a great career. As we all know, and as this story has taught us, we can't ultimately control what happens to us in life. However, there are a variety of things we can do to better our situation. And, as for Eve, she always made the best out of hers. You know, one of the things I came to realise from this case is that Eve was so very fucking loved. And I know that swearing can be inappropriate, but it's because I really, really mean it. One of the many ways I gather info for a case is through online obituaries, and never have I ever seen so many comments left behind for a victim. For Eve, it was almost a thousand. The 15 year anniversary of her death comes just a few days after posting this video, and even still, she receives several comments per month. And even after speaking to several people living in the local area, they've confirmed that Eve is still well known around the campus. Sadly, Eve's life is a story that will forever remain unwritten. A story that was destined for great success and positivity, but ultimately was lost for several hundred dollars. I'm gonna wrap this one up here folks, I think I've pretty much nailed the story, but of course I could have gone on much longer about her success and achievements. My question for you is, what do you think about this case? Do you think that if the probation officer spent more time on Demario and Lawrence, could this have all avoided Eve's death? And another question for you, but many people still argue that Abhijit was murdered by Lawrence, so do you think he did it? Anyway folks, that is all from me today, and thank you so much for watching another video by Coffee House Crime. If you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, I really do appreciate it, and it really does help me out. I'm back again very soon for another video, likely after this whole Covid spell is gone. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.